Welcome from the Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee. We're here at the EMS World Expo, the largest EMS dedicated event in the world. This is EMS World Presents Stories from Expo. Your story continues here. Hello and welcome from Nashville, Tennessee, Music City Center. This is the 2018 EMS World Expo. This is EMS World Podcast. Uh, conjoining with the uh, EMS Garage podcast to kind of have a double team. And we are here talking to Samuel. Samuel, what was your last name? Cordick. Cordick. Uh, Samuel actually has a poster board presentation and a uh, oral presentation. Uh, you said it was in conjunction with or, or at least born from the... From the pre-hospital care research yes, the, forum. Yeah, yep, the, the pre-hospital research forum. Um, Tell me a little bit about it. I don't know anything. <laughs> sure. So we were looking at the use of ketamine for sedating psychiatric patients, agitated psychiatric patients. There's obviously a lot of controversy right now. It's been in the news some. Mm. And our agency, a lot of other agencies, have been looking at ketamine for that agitated patient. The, the most popular options are benzos and antipsychotics. And a lot of paramedics think ketamine is a pretty favorable option, but it's not widely available. So we were really looking at, is ketamine safe? and doesn't have adverse events, how does that profile compare to a benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic? So our project, we use the ESO Solutions research data set from 2017, it's about five million patients from all over the United States, okay. so a very large data set. And we looked for psychiatric patients who were over 13 years old, who had a psychiatric emergency and received some kind of chemical sedation or a ketamine, a benzodiazepine, antipsychotic. We found we had 3,020 patients, so it's a very large number, which gave us a, a great ability to get some good statistical power uh, compared to single agency studies. And we looked at, we were, the hypothesis we set out to prove was that ketamine has fewer adverse events. We actually disproved that. We found that ketamine was associated with more frequent airway management and ventilation than the other types of medications. Okay, what type of, uh, you say, you know, increased frequency of, of need for airway management what does that mean? Like you give it and they're conking out and puking or, sorry, that's probably not the scientific term, but you know what I mean? Uh, is that, or just like you give the dose they're supposed to get and all of a sudden they're hypersensitive to it or? Yeah, so we were doing a retrospective review. We were basing it off paramedic documentation, which has some limitations. We can't really mm -hmm. sit in their head and know what's going on, but what, what we were looking at is after the medication was administered, did they have a treatment associated with uh, non-invasive ventilation or non-invasive airway management, which could include anything from an NPA, OPA to CPEP BVM for ventilation or even an invasive airway management like a king tube or uh, other supraglottic airways, endotracheal intubation. And we were speculating or, or hypothesizing that if they received one of those treatments, that it was because they required some kind of support for their airway or their respirations. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Um, sometimes, especially when you're dealing with EPCRs and, and that kind of documentation, that's you kind of have to do. Uh, you yeah. have to suppose those things. And it, it, it's not like it's a, a stretch <laughs> to make that inference. Um, is there any, is it, is it somewhat of a, a perception of ketamine? So, like, let's say, is the reason that it's having a more increased uh, adverse reaction. Is it because people are giving it to, it's, their, it's the big gun, right? So they're giving it to people who are already perhaps more likely to have a? That's a really great question. Uh, with our data set being from, it's de-identified patient data. We don't know what agency or even what state the patient was in. We don't know what their protocols were. So we could only look at, they got this medication in this context, a psychiatric emergency, and, and then these are the treatments that were provided. It would be really, really great to conduct a similar study and actually have some sort of way to determine, was the patient agitated? How agitated were they? Were they that really, really agitated patient who needs the big guns? Or were they just a, a little agitated? That's really, really hard to parse out from the data. Okay. And as far as using a benzodiazepine or antipsychotic instead of um, aren't there are there limitations to say like Halbo? I mean, isn't doesn't that work best on somebody with a known psychotic or psychiatric history? 
generally, antipsychotics tend to work better on patients who have an underlying known psychiatric condition, and there's all these other factors that can go into yeah. that psychiatric presentation. The other big concern that a lot of EMS professionals have is antipsychotics have a very delayed onset. And typically, we want something fast, and it's usually in the best interest for us and the patients. If the patient's trying to harm themselves or others, to achieve rapid sedation. So antipsychotics tend to have a much longer onset time, which is why benzodiazepines are more attractive. But benzodiazepines also have their own limitations. I'm sure you have a lot of numbers and statistics in your, in your poster board. So if you don't know the exact number, and feel free to not give me an answer, if because I understand specificity is important. Um, but do you know, compared to say benzodiazepines, what is the percentage? How much more likely are you to have an adverse airway uh, problem arise after sure. ketamine administration? So the, the most dramatic, really surprising result for us was that with ketamine compared to benzodiazepines or antipsychotics, which we, we grouped together for this study, they were 13.56 times more likely to need non-invasive airway management, which is a, a really staggeringly high increase. Yeah, it's a very significant percent as well. Yeah. And between three and four times more likely to need invasive airway management, which is also surprising. Wow. So do you make a... I mean, I, I don't know what your standing is. Are, what is, are you a paramedic or a... Yes, I'm a paramedic uh, paramedic educator and do QA, QI. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we have a similar background then. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what would your recommendation be? I mean, I know necessarily we're not always the, the guys that get to make the rules. But yep. from just this study, would you say it's worth looking at using less, more training, just being aware that if you're administering ketamine, you, you might also want to attempt a mail and patty beforehand just in case. You know, what do you... Yeah, I, I think there's really three big takeaways from the project we did. One is that we need to do more research in this area. Psychiatric patients are really, really challenging. Uh, we were really surprised by how few patients got vital signs before the medication, which... Yeah. In clinical context, if you have an agitated patient, that's really hard to get. But yeah. if you don't have that, you're, you're kind of shooting in the dark. So more research definitely is, is needed into the safety of ketamine and benzodiazepines. Um, but another big takeaway is for agencies that are looking at ketamine for this purpose, and my home agency, Cypress Creek EMS, we have been thinking mm -hmm. about this. We've been kind of inching our way into using ketamine more. It really poses a, a, a strong caution that based on our research findings, which there's huge limitations with, just the, the retrospective nature of it, probably medical directors and, and clinical staff should be really cautious and monitor the uses of ketamine for psychiatric patients with caution. Yep. And, and the third takeaway was looking at just how many patients needed airway and ventilation management across the board, regardless of what medication category was used. Paramedics really need to know that if they are pulling out a chemical sedative, for this agitated psychiatric patients, they need to have an airway plan in place, they need to have a ventilation plan in place. They, they shouldn't be waiting for that patient to be sedated to then figure out what tools they need. And, and really part of a sedation plan or sedation package should include having a BVM ready, having airway tools ready, oh, yeah. and being ready to manage the airway if, if needed. And say, you know, monitoring and tidal, even if they're Absolutely. not ex experiencing. Sometimes it's, it's best not to wait till you you notice Something's missing here. Oh, it's his, his breathing. He's not breathing yeah. anymore. How long has that been going on? <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you brought up Entitl. Um, we looked at Entitl. A, a lot of these patients did get Entitl values monitored, and that is really an incredible tool for this type of patient to be able to see what the respiratory drive is way before they start desaturating. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, I mean, it's the gold standard, and the gold standard for a reason because it, it works. Absolutely. Um, I, there's not many... Not many tools that can show you uh, a number and a waveform like that, and you know, I mean, you see a you see a QRS complex, doesn't necessarily mean anything. You see yeah. a waveform on the end title, you know or, they're breathing. Yeah, right. And uh, it's a it's an excellent tool. I, I mean, every not every but a lot of patients can benefit from, from absolutely that kind of monitoring. Um, yeah. So, anything else you have to you have to kind of add about your well, I'd, it's been pretty thorough I'd, so I'd want to give a pretty huge shout out to pre-hospital care research forum. Yeah. Oh, you uh, know, sorry, continue that and then I have yeah. another question. Yeah. So I'm new in EMS research. I've been involved with some research projects on the, the data abstraction collection side, sure. involved in some as a paramedic being studied or, or being one of the 
people applying a treatment in the field, and I had a strong interest in research, and their pre-hospital care research forum events that they put on are a, a really unparalleled ability to work with a real world research problem with incredible faculty who are super experienced at doing this kind of research. Uh, the co-authors that were on my paper that were our mentor faculties included Remley Crow, who won the best research award okay. this year, yeah. uh, David Wampler, who won it last year. Sure, sure. So they were our direct faculty members, David Page, and uh, who was also, also co-author, Dr. Brent Myers, also co-author, and other people at the event like Lawrence Brown or Henry Wang from UT, who are these rock star researchers who are willing to just help understand the mechanics of how do you go from an idea or hypothesis to actually having a finished research project? And that's truly an unbelievable opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Which makes me think, or my, that was my additional question here. Why, wh why did you choose this as your topic? Is it something you're passionate about? Have you had yourself uh, bad experiences, bad experiences with <laughs> ketamine or? I haven't personally had any experiences right, at all no. with ketamine, uh, but I, I have a strong interest in ketamine. I, I think it's a pretty interesting drug. We've seen it used very effectively for pain. We've seen it used very effectively for sedation. At my agency, we've been using it for excited delirium yep. and have found it to be a phenomenal tool, really unparalleled for treatment of excited delirium patients, which I think are a different category. And out of all the options we started brainstorming, and there's a lot of them that I'm interested in, ketamine seemed to me that, to be the one where there's the most need for valid data and data in the yeah. pre-hospital world, yeah. which is so different than the hospital environment. Certainly, that makes sense. I mean, it's new, um, and uh, sometimes people jump board, jump on board to the new fun stuff before they, you know, yeah. uh, not, maybe not before, but yeah, more information, the better. Yeah, as because we started exploring ketamine in our protocols and our medical director was, we were looking at, okay, where, where can we use this and what is the evidence support? We just realized that there was not very much data out there and our medical director is uh, Dr. Levon Vartanian. He's, he's an incredible guy. He's very passionate about evidence-based practice, so he wants to see the studies before he's willing to make a change. And we realize with ketamine, there's just not very much data. Mm -hmm. Well, if anybody has any questions for you or any of the other uh, authors on the study, is there any way they can get a hold of you on social media or say an yeah. email? Yeah, or... social media is probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'm very okay. active on Twitter. Yep. Uh, my handle is at Samuel Kordik, S-A-M-U-E-L-K-O-R-D-I-K. Yep. Or email is S-Kordik, S-K-O-R-D-I-K, at C-C-E-M-S.com. Okay. And I would love to hear from people. Uh, with this project in particular, Twitter was actually incredibly useful. There's an incredible community of researchers and EMS people on Twitter that I popped out saying, hey, we're looking at ketamine. What should we be looking at? What are some studies out there? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I started getting all this information from folks all over the world saying, yeah. hey, look at this guy, look at these papers. It's an, an incredible asset. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, if you know how to use it. I'm not, I should, I should, I should learn a little bit more about Twitter, but that's, that's probably for a different <laughs> podcast. Um, yeah, so uh, reach out to him on social media or uh, his personal email if you care to get any more information on those topics. Mm -hmm. uh, for more uh, content and videos, uh, we have a lot of good interviews. Stay on this channel, peruse our videos. Um, this has been EMS Garage Podcast and EMS World Podcast uh, here recording at the EMS World Expo in Nashville.